Welcome to our Champions Live broadcast. I'm Rita Santa Maria. I'm the owner, the founder of Champions School of Real Estate. And I'm so happy to have with me today two of our wonderful, longtime, loyal customers that are in the commercial side of real estate. But before I introduce them and start talking with them, I want to say hello to North Dallas Plano. Hello to our wonderful Fort Worth students, as well as Austin, as well as San Antonio, and most definitely Houston, but all over the state of Texas. Live broadcast just allows us to make the delivery exactly what you want it to be. Whether it's in the classroom, whether it's online, or live broadcast like today. It is always our goal at Champion School of Real Estate to bring you additional added value. And the added value today is being able to bring into our conversation and our interaction an interview with two longtime professionals on the commercial side. And um, the overwhelming majority of agents in real estate, as every one of you know, is in residential. We've interviewed some outstanding residential agents, brokers, and today we're going to get to know more about the land side, the land development and uh, land acquisition through Mark Terpstra. And Mark is with the Caldwell Companies and has been in the business for a long time. Family has been in the business for a long time. And, uh, and then also my friend, Brenda Pennington, who has been on the commercial office leasing side, office sales, and um, Brenda has her own company, it's B. Pennington, and uh, Mark, as I mentioned, is with the Caldwell Company. So today you're going to get a wonderful insight. We're going to do some basic information and then mm -hmm. as well bring it into, frankly, what they do all day long to be the successes that they are. So, welcome, right off the bat, I'm just going to throw the question out to the two of you. When people come into Champion School of Real Estate, they generally assume and say they want to go into residential sales. The two of you are in that minority side that says, no, I have a different direction, I'm going to go into commercial. So if you would let our students and our friends across the state, if not the globe today, know why did you decide to go into commercial? And we'll just say ladies first. So Brenda, talk to us about commercial. What made you decide to go that direction? Well, that's a good question and a great place to begin. Um, I remember my very first day in real estate class at Champion School of Real Estate. I, I asked myself, what's the real difference between residential and commercial? And as I broke it down, I realized, okay, residential is seven days a week, holidays, weekends, <laughs> nights, with women, children, and uh, their husbands. And then commercial is Monday through Friday, eight to five, no holidays, no nights, no weekends with men. So I said, oh, sign me up for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was young. Uh, but you know what? It was, a, it was a great decision. And Mark, how did you decide? Although I think I know the answer. Well, part of it, not. as you mentioned, uh, I guess it's a little bit in my blood. I was, uh, my family was in the commercial side of things uh, growing up, so I got a taste of it. But uh, I learned it's something I wanted to do, uh, similarly, similar to your answer, for the same reasons uh, I believe it provides you more of a flexible work schedule than uh, residential. Uh, I too started off in residential, actually, uh, my first year uh, of, of the business. I was selling houses while I was going to college uh, up in Waco, Texas, <clears throat> and I worked at Colwell Banker, and so I got a taste of residential. And you know it can be uh, a little more daunting. I, mean, I remember the first client that I sold a house to. I probably showed him about 50 houses, and that was probably <laughs> not, not, not so good tired? on my not so good on my part. I probably should have uh, uh, found them better selections. But nonetheless, uh, they stuck with it and stuck with the process and bought one from me. But uh, 
I remember it was a lot of work uh, trying to trying to show all those houses on weekends and weeknights. And so, um, to your point, uh, you you get more of a flexible schedule. Uh, not that you don't ever work uh, weekends and, and weeknights because you do, but you do have that flexibility. Uh, also, I just uh, I tend to find that the, the paychecks are a little bit larger in commercial real estate. Transaction size is just typically larger. Uh, uh, I think on average, you know, we're, we're doing transactions, uh, two, three, four, five million dollar uh, deals, so the commissions are bigger. But uh, <clears throat> more than that, you know, I just like uh, being part of watching the community and being part of developing the community. It's, it's great when we go shopping, uh, grocery shopping, my friends and my family and my neighbors, and I can look up and say, hey, you know, I, I help bring those guys into the neighborhood. So uh, for me, that's, that's really satisfying. It is satisfying. It's really heartwarming when you go out and see people that you've been able to help. And I had no idea that you started out in residential, but you did that while you were in college, which shows all the ambition that you had to be in college and then out selling houses. Did you find it very difficult to um, to make yourself believable at a young age when you're showing houses to people, did you have any difficulty with that, or how did you overcome it? A little bit. Uh, they say in our industry, it's it's good to have a little gray hair because t people tend to uh, believe you a little bit more and take you a little more serious. So as a as a college kid coming out uh, and, and trying to do it, yeah, I felt a little a little awkward at times. But I will say this: uh, the company that I started with. Uh, Coldwell Banker, they had a great uh, training program and uh, they uh, helped mentor me and, and, and teach me a lot of the ropes. So it definitely made the uh, made it possible to, to learn the business. And so. Uh, and yeah. then you made the transition over to commercial when you. After I graduated, graduated. college, I moved back to Houston. Uh -huh. uh, that's when I, I knew I didn't really want to do residential. I wanted to focus on commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I already had a good basis, uh, understanding of contracts and things like that and the whole uh, process. Uh, for a transaction. So when I came to Houston, then I uh, transitioned into commercial, and that was 1996, and I've been at it for uh, was that 20, 22 years. And Brenda, you've been in the business for 24 years, I believe, if I have that number right somehow. Uh, I always tell my teachers, if you just say over 20 years, that's great. <laughs> that's very, very experienced. I have some instructors that have had their license for like 35 years, and I'm like, no, don't say that in the classroom because they'll say, wow, are you really up to date with everything? Uh -huh. And the truth is they are really up to date with everything because that is our, our side of the promise is that when you're in the classroom, you do get information that's current, up to date. Um, but let's go back to the basics, if you can think back when you got started. And Brenda, what did you do to get started in commercial? Because that's always the question our students want to know, is we teach so many courses that um, are marketing courses, how to get started in real estate, and often people think, oh, well, that's just how you get started in residential. But think back, if both of you would, how did you start your business on the commercial side? Um, well, I started at the bottom, um, which was as a receptionist for a development company. Um, Beeson Property was, was the name of the company. Uh, in fact, they're still in existence. They're big in retail. But at the time, they started developing uh, West Houston, uh, the West Chase part of Houston, building office buildings. So I answered the phone. It's amazing how much you can learn answering the phone. Exactly. Uh, so that's where I, I started, you know, as an assistant mm -hmm. to um, uh, the lady who handled the leasing for the development of the office building. We have a number of people that walk in the door, and uh, you've hit on two things so far. We have people that walk in the door that have retired from one career, and they say to us, to the counselors, is it too late for me to start a new career? And when Mark mentioned the gray hair helps, we say, you know what? <laughs> you actually get extra points for having a little age. <laughs> yes, you can start a new career. We also have people that walk in the door and say, I've been a receptionist for a real estate company or a development company. And um, gosh, I think I want to get a real estate license. So you saw what they were doing and thought, gosh, maybe I'll give that a try. What about you, Mark? How, 
How did you make that decision? Do you remember a defining moment where you decided, and how did you get started on the commercial side? Well, I mean, again, I always knew that I wanted to do commercial. I actually uh -huh. uh, majored in real estate in college uh, okay. with the full intent of going into real estate, uh -huh. uh, which is one reason I started off uh, doing more or less an internship and working at Coldwell Banker in Waco uh, to get my feet wet and to, to learn the business. Uh, and that was a great background for me, uh, but I will say that transitioning into commercial is, is a big step. Uh, and I would not ever undervalue the, if you have the opportunity to uh, join a company that provides uh, the good tools uh, necessary to learn, uh, a good support system, uh, a company that will mentor you, uh, I think that's that's really important. That's it's I really was wondering, key. Did you have a mentor that you sort of worked with, or watched, or listened to, and sort of followed in their footsteps? I've had numerous mentors uh, throughout my life, and I think that's really invaluable. Uh, from growing up in a family with it, my father was in the industry. I learned a lot from him. Uh, when I worked selling houses, uh, there was uh, an agent there, who, one of the most successful agents in the company. Her plate was quite full, and so she, you know, saw an opportunity to, to bring me in under her wing, and I helped her with her business. Uh, all the things that she didn't want to do, I was there and became invaluable to her. Uh, and in turn, she taught me a lot of things about the business. So uh, that was really good. And then uh, even now, where I'm at at uh, Caldwell Companies, you know, a commercial real estate firm, uh, we provide support for all of our new hires. We don't just uh, bring you in and throw you out to the wolves. There's mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks in our company that uh, are just getting their license for the first time. They've never been in the real estate industry. We bring them in and we, we assign them to another broker, uh, an experienced broker with gray hair, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and we teach them the ropes. And that process, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's a year of uh, hands-on experience or more before we feel like they're ready to get out and do it on their own. So I, I think you know, if you're truly interested in commercial real estate, uh, you need to be mentored and you need to learn it, it more than just classwork, it's, it's experience. Now how did you decide to go on your own? Because you, Brenda R.B. Pennington, and uh, that's a huge step to have your own company. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that came about. Uh, I worked for numerous fabulous companies in, in California and the Mass Brothers in Fort Worth and I was, I was a young married person and my husband was transferred from Fort Worth to Houston, although I am a native Houstonian. Uh, we were transferred back to Houston and I could not find a job. I could not find a job. It was, it was post oil crash and um, I just said, well, Brenda, I mean, you have only one place to go to work, and that is you have to hire yourself. <laughs> so, you know, I started in my dining room. Yeah, you know, my, my uh, best advice, if you are uh, an independent agent, is to get up every morning and get dressed, put on those high heels or the, that, that uh, suit. <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, if you have no appointments, you look like you have an appointment, and you go to your office, whether it's in your dining room or your bedroom or, you know, for me, my car. So you literally would dress up. Yes. And you're in your house, yes. and you're doing business out of your house, yes. but you dressed up and you got ready to greet the day That's, and yes, be I in did. business. Yes. Good for you, because yeah. that is straight out of our textbook, <laughs> that yes, you can work out of your home, but it's just a whole different feeling when you get up and you are ready for the day mm -hmm. and you're dressed for the day, mm -hmm. but that did take a lot of courage, and there are so many people, again, that come in and say, you know, do you think I can do it? I worked all my life for somebody else, and yet I know I have a lot of great qualities. And we always say yes, because no one can look into a crystal ball and say, you're gonna be successful, you're not gonna be successful. And uh, so good for you, you just said, I can't find a job, so I'm gonna be on my own and make it work. That's right. So what do each of you find most challenging? about commercial real estate? Is it the client? Is it the transaction? What are the roadblocks that tend to just really kind of uh, add a little frustration and maybe make the whole process a little more annoying? What, what do you find on the commercial side that really 
causes you the most stress? Either one. Ah, roadblocks. Well, um, it, obviously, it's a it's a commission only business if you're where I am. And uh, you know, there are times when I lose. I've, I have lost faith. You know, like I haven't done a deal in how many months? And uh, you know. Am I ever going to, is the phone ever going to ring? Am I, am I ever going to get another referral? And I still sometimes, you know, find myself having those feelings. So the roadblock is really me. Um, but then I look back and I go, how many times, how many times have you felt that same way? And, you know, the sun always comes up and the checks always come in. So I think my biggest roadblock is, you know, my ability yeah. to, you know, have that, have that faith. Mm -hmm. We talk about that so much because without question, being an entrepreneur, being your own boss, and no matter how experienced you are, still you're like thinking, okay, do I have anything in the pipeline? Uh, how am I going to get it in the pipeline? And even though all these years later, what I love for our people watching today is that many of you are going into the business, some of you in it right now, that will be like the number one issue you're gonna to have to deal with, and that is yourself. And telling yourself, it's going to be okay, I'm going to have that transaction, if you're doing everything you need to do. And I know that Brenda and Mark get up every morning dressed, suited up, ready to have a transaction come together. But all of us need to be aware that um, you're going to have that fear. And certainly having faith in yourself is huge to be successful in real estate. So without question, faith that the money is going to be there tomorrow, phone's going to ring, buyer's going to walk in the door. What do you find most challenging, Mark? I think uh, very much what you said. It's, uh, it's the fluctuation of the paycheck. There's no steady paycheck in commercial real estate. Uh, sometimes you can go months without a deal and then other times uh, the deals come and it's three or four at once. So uh, uh, I relate that to when I first started. Did you ever complain about that? Whether uh, it's three or four at once? No, that part's great <laughs> and, but it, it's it's the the valley that uh, concerns me and right. I, when, when I first came back to Houston in 96 and, uh, and started real estate I don't know if it was just luck or whatnot but uh, right off the bat, I got several deals in the title company and, and closed them. And all of a sudden, you know, here I am, fresh out of college, just started the business and, and made some pretty good money. And I'm thinking, well, this awesome. is this is easy. great. You know, this is this is easy money. Uh, so what's the first thing I did? I went and furnished my new apartment and uh, bought fifteen thousand dollars worth of furniture on my credit card. And then all of a sudden, the uh, market took a little bit of a downturn, oh, and I didn't have uh, any deals closed for several months, and um, all of a sudden, 15000 in debt, and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is terrible, what do I do? And it took me a while to dig myself out of that hole, uh, but the biggest lesson, the biggest takeaway from that is, uh, you know, real estate's one of those things you have to budget. You have to put yourself on a budget, and you have to uh, learn to, to make it through the drought. You're going to have to save when things are really good. And, and so, you know, for me, that's part of it, uh, the, the unsteady paycheck, but I've learned to overcome that and, and budget things better. Uh, and then just overall, the, the transaction time. I think that's another uh, frustrating thing in commercial real estate. Uh, typically, you know, your residential transactions are going to be 30, 45 days uh, on average, I would say. Uh, commercial real estate, I think average transaction time is about 90 days, and quite often I've had transactions go a lot further. I think uh, my longest transaction from start to finish from the time they went under contract until closing was about a year and a half. So that's a long time to sit there and wait and hope for a paycheck and, and you know, finally it comes through. My husband Henry, uh, his career was commercial real estate, is commercial real estate, and my background was, is education for a couple of years and then I told my dad I didn't care for it so I went into real estate sales and when Henry and I got married and I chose residential and I said to him how in the world do you wait so long I mean you find a buyer in residential and if they're pre-approved and everything's great you're gonna be in closing 
within 30, 40 days, as you mentioned. You all can wait three months, six months, a year. That is just too long to wait. <laughs> That's so the I course. congratulate you on that because it takes a lot of patience, for sure. It does. And uh, you said something fun. Um, always agents say, gosh, oh, it's so slow. The next thing you know, they walk in to take their classes and they're like, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. And that's why I said, surely I know you weren't complaining when things <laughs> were, were busy. We no. should be so appreciative of that, and of course you were. But another really good lesson for our new people uh, in that, as you said, you got your first couple of checks and thought, man, this is easy money, and then woo, you had that little down cycle. <laughs> so uh, great learning lessons for everyone, and another I think very interesting part of our discussion for everyone watching today will be tell us what is it like a day in the life of your life, Brenda? What is it like to show office buildings? What do you do to prepare for it? When you're doing leases, what do you do to prepare for that? Could you just sort of do like a little short educational tutorial for our students that are curious about office leasing? and office sales. Okay, well, we, we have two different office leasing divisions at B. Pennington Commercial Real Estate. One is the landlord representation side, uh, and the other is the tenant representation side. The tenant representation side is, is my preferred uh, division, well, that I'm more involved in. Uh, the landlord reputation, the landlord representation side is where we have uh, building owners who are our clients, and uh, we make sure their buildings stay full with tenants. We bring new tenants, we renew them, we expand them. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, we decrease the size. So there's, there's always some musical chairs How going on. How far out do you notify them before their lease expires? A year. A year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the best lesson I ever got on when do you start the renewal process, and the answer is the day they move in. Uh, you know, you just want to stay in, in contact with them, make them feel valued mm -hmm. uh, and, and happy. If a tenant is happy, they're going to want to stay. Exactly. Uh, so the, the, a typical day uh, may start for me in the tenant representation side as not having an appointment, mm -hmm. uh, but then end, ending up having three. I mean, yesterday was a great example. Uh, it's rare that I don't have, you know, uh, an appointment first rattle out of the bag at 8 a.m., but yesterday was one of those mornings where I thought, I can have breakfast sitting down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I enjoyed my cup of coffee, and, you know, I started my bowl of cereal, and the phone rang. It was a retailer who uh, is looking to move her lighting store from one location to the other, and she said, the only time I can see space is at 9.45. And uh, fortunately, At what time was it then? Uh, that was uh, it was about eight. It was about eight thirty, uh -huh. and uh, so I had some preparation to do. I had some keys to get. I had some phone calls to make to make sure I could I could show the property that she was interested in. Um, do some research with uh, you know so on surrounding uh, buildings to make sure that the rate that was being quoted was in line with the competitors. Uh, so I guess I had I had an hour. Which, which was plenty of time to do what I needed to do. Um, so I met her at the particular building and, and showed her the space. And then she said, you know what, I want to see this building and that building. And, and on Wednesday, my husband wants to see the other building that you've been talking about on 99, which, by the way, he sold the land for. Um, and so it's, it's, I think that's why I love this business is because it's, it's, it's adrenaline for me. You know, I can have... Uh, I can have, uh, think I have a free moment <laughs> and the phone <laughs> rings. Now, I don't have to say, yes, I'll, I'll meet you. And there are many times when, when, you know, it ends up being, you know, a week later rather than that moment. But I like to jump and so go. says what kind of broker you are, what kind of agent you are. You're very customer oriented yeah. because you're like, okay, I can do that. Yeah. And there's a crossover there for sure with residential as well, getting that last minute call and 
I want to look here, 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 here. So mm -hmm. there is a crossover in that respect. Yes. And how do you qualify your commercial agent, or your commercial buyer, tenant? Uh, from an office building standpoint, well, retail is a little different than office building, so I'll, I'll, I'll share how we qualify the retail user. We'll take, for example, this lighting, this lady who sells chandeliers. Um, she's been in business for 35 years. It was her parents' company, and now she's taken it over. So, you know, the first thing I tell the building owner is, you're going to want this tenant. Uh, I know. I know for a fact they paid their rent for 35 years, mm -hmm. and that goes a long way because one thing the landlord wants to know is, if I take a risk on them, are they going to pay me rent? Uh, whether When it's a new retailer, we ask for a business plan, uh, we ask for financials, both corporate and um, personal, because a new company with, without a track record will oftentimes have to personally guarantee a lease. Um, so that's what we do on a, on a retail. On an office, normally we um, get close to negotiated terms and then provide financial statements to give the landlord a level of comfort. Good, good, very interesting. I can promise you that there are at least 80 to 100 people that wrote that information down. Oh, wow. They found it very interesting. So how does your day start out, Mark, and what is, sort of a day in the life of Mark Terpstra on the land development side. Our days are typically not uh, very structured uh, in that we, you never quite know what you're going to get. Some days are filled with meetings, like you said, and other days uh, maybe we don't have as many meetings. Uh, for me, my niche is really land. Uh, that's what I do. We, uh, we broker land, develop land, uh, look for investment properties. Uh, and then we represent buyers who are looking for land. So uh, unlike where you have to go show an office building or if you're in residential, you're showing houses, uh, there's not really a whole lot to show when it comes to land. Uh, most people- <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> well, well, most people typically want to see, they get a better idea of what the land is all about if you show them a survey or an aerial like you would get from Google Earth. Uh, you can typically see land a little bit better in its position relative to other things around it by looking at a map than you can by physically looking at it. And most people that, you know, if they like what they see, they'll drive by it themselves and say, oh, well, there it is. And it doesn't really require uh, an agent being there to show them the land. Not always. Some some folks do like you to, to show up and, you know, explain certain things and aspects of the property. but. Uh, more often than not, they just want to want you to email them something. So our appointments for actually showing property, uh, we don't have as many of those. On the flip side of it, though, we're constantly looking for new inventory. Uh, we're constantly trying to get new land listings. We're prospecting for those listings. Uh, so a, a large part of our day consists of prospecting. Uh, for us, uh, we have to knock on a lot of doors in order to get listings. So uh, we're constantly looking for new land. Uh, for listings, for investment, for development, uh, and then on the flip side, uh, uh, we're looking for buyers. We represent certain buyers, whether it be retailers or industrial users or residential developers who come to us. They're looking for land where they can develop a product. And so if we don't have it in our inventory, then we're out uh, searching to find that perfect piece for them. So uh, the day can be pretty unstructured, uh, trying to handle all these different needs. So it just it just depends. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that um, I feel like certainly our students would love to just have some basic understanding. When I was so impressed when I got both of your bios and I was reading about both of them, and at the end of Mark's bio, he's talking about his key role with his clients, and he says, that he works on site selection. What exactly do you mean by site selection? Well, site selection would be when we represent buyers. Maybe we're representing HEB or Home Depot or uh, some retailer. Uh, they're looking for a new site. We know the general area they want to be in, and you know they would have us go do the site selection for them. Uh, it's, at that point, we go out and we try to find the perfect site that suits all their criteria. So that's typically what I mean by site selection. So you're really sort of a bird dog for them. Absolutely. They say, I want to locate somewhere in this particular geographic area, and then you go out and do all the legwork. 
Correct. Never knowing if, in fact, they're going to really locate there. You never know for sure. They give you a pretty good idea, and we know what their criteria are. So um, that's uh, one reason they hire us, because we're experts typically in our field, and, and we can help them find the property that's going to suit their needs. And that has to be sort of the high that Brenda was talking about. So now you go out and you do the legwork, and then they say, yes, Mark, that's exactly where we want to be. That's what we, that's what we hope to hear. <laughs> that's what you want to hear for sure. And then acquisitions, how do you work on the acquisition? What does that mean? What does that word mean if you are explaining to a class of people that had no idea on the definition? Acquisitions could mean a variety of things. I mean, again, if I'm representing a buyer, uh, helping them with a particular acquisition, um, I'm going to help facilitate that transaction. Acquisitions usually uh, means getting it to contract and helping them through the transaction process. So uh, it could mean from negotiating the deal, uh, helping them understand all the pitfalls, uh, to, to seeing that deal all the way to close and overcome all of the challenges and roadblocks along the way. So would you say that you work 50-50 with um, owners versus buyers looking for property, or are you more on the finding the property for an owner? Yeah, I would say that my business is about 50-50. Uh, about 50% of my time is allocated towards finding new listings and, and representing owners. Uh, the other 50% of my time is actually representing buyers uh, or investors who just want to buy property and they come to us to, to find that property for them. Now on the development side, you have here that you are involved in development issues. What's involved with the development of the property? I mean, either of you. Well, I mean, back to what we were talking about, uh, the, the transaction time is so long. It can be anywhere from 90 days up to a year. And the reason it's so long in commercial is because it's, uh, there's a lot more that goes into it than just buying a house where you have to get uh, a, a simple inspection. Uh, most buyers who buy commercial real estate and are willing to spend millions of dollars on this land, they don't want to spend that money unless they know that it can be developed and used for their purpose. Uh, for those reasons, they get pretty in-depth with various studies to make sure that the property meets their needs. Uh, surveys, topos, environmental, environmental reports, uh, geotechnical reports, uh, you name it, they're doing all kinds of different studies on the property to make sure that it, it's going to meet all of their criteria. And that just takes time. And what I found with land and most commercial real estate is uh, you're constantly encountering roadblocks. It's impossible for us to go out and find a piece of land and know everything about it from day one. You, you have to go through these certain processes in order to uh, reveal all of the issues that could be involved with that piece of property. And that sometimes takes 60 days to over a year. And uh, you know it can be disheartening at times because a lot of times you spend a lot of time and money and effort into finding the perfect property and you think it's perfect and you get 90 days down the road or 100 days down the road and you all of a sudden you're hit with a development issue and it becomes uh, you know too impossible to proceed and they end up uh, falling out of contract and you don't get the deal so uh, a lot of times w one way that we bring value to our clients is understanding the role of development understanding what those roadblocks can be and thinking of ways that we can overcome those roadblocks so being able to think outside of the box uh, being knowledgeable about development, civil engineering, being able to identify all of the challenges, and more than anything, being able to come up with solutions, uh, that's really key in commercial real estate. It's a lot more than just the acquisition and getting it under contract. You know, I'll, I'll relate it to, to football. Uh, getting a property under contract is like receiving the kickoff and running to the 20-yard line. After it's under contract, you, know, you still have 80 yards to go to get to the closing. So, and, and for me, that's the most difficult part. It's, it's getting that last 80 yards, it's overcoming all the hurdles, all the people that are trying to block you, and it's getting it to that finish line. And in order to do that, you, I can't overemphasize uh, educating uh, yourself on legal aspects, development aspects, and it's really, it's crucial. That was very, very, very informative. Good Back. job. Right now, we probably have some students clapping in the classroom ah. because 
that explains so much. Mm -hmm. And I know that Brenda also is involved in that from time to time. And you both are so knowledgeable about the transaction after you get the contract written. And I know that there are different entities that you have to be familiar with, like TechStop, like engineers, and what kind of engineers? Are they environmental or are they for the land and the development? You both have learned so much that makes the transaction go so much more smoothly for the buyer. Where do you get, and this is not like a trick question going, oh, go to Champion School of Real Estate, but where do you get, where have you learned all of that wonderful knowledge on what are the roadblocks? What are the entities that can cause a halt to the development of the project? How did you learn all of that? Was it through a mentor? Was it through, is there a certain place you like to go for understanding and more education? Uh, well, I have a mentor who is a developer in Northwest Houston. Mm -hmm. And um, in Northwest Houston, unlike parts of North Texas, for example, uh, we have mud districts. Um, uh, we sold a piece of property, actually it was a golf course, to a guy in Dallas who bought a golf course in Houston. When he, all he saw was a beautiful piece of property. He didn't understand that it, A, was in the floodplain, oh boy. And, and, and B, that it had no utilities. So he saw a beautiful piece of property and said, I'll build a development on it. Um, we had spent a lot of time with the Mud District engineers uh, and the Mud District to, to have some prior knowledge about was there capacity, even if, even if the Mud District wanted to grant utilities, did they have the ability to grant the utilities? Mm -hmm. So the education um, you know, we had was prior knowledge uh, from, and unfortunately this was after the transaction because we didn't represent the land, uh, the, the, the buyer uh, on that particular transaction. Um, so you're saying almost like OJT, here's the problem so now we have to pull it apart to right, figure right, right. out how to make it work. Right, right. And, and, and <clears throat> it's a long story but we were able to bridge the gap and create some uh, utility capacity and make some trades for trading parkland for development land and putting restrictions where there are no restrictions. <clears throat> in Houston, we do not have zoning. And uh, uh, Mark's uh, owner says it best, Fred Caldwell, he said in Houston we have uh, economic zoning, <laughs> which means the price of the land is gonna dictate what you can build exactly. on it. Exactly. So you can't take That's a- That's a good term. Yeah, you can't take a, a $20 per square foot piece of land and put a mini storage building on it because the numbers just don't work. So, um, so, so every experience is, is something you put sort of in your file over here to use for the next. And um, you know, it doesn't matter how seasoned a person is in the business, whether it's leasing or sales or development, uh, there's always a surprise. Uh, there's a particular transaction uh, in the Woodlands area that I'm working on and uh, we overcame all kind of detention issues. And the last, uh, the last issue, which was a deal killer, was yes, there's water, but the, but the pipe that comes from the source is not big enough to provide the pressure of water needed to supply the building that housed, you know, 100 oh, children no. in it because it was for a school. So, who, uh. I mean, it, and the developer who was the master plan developer, you know, it was a surprise to him, much less the, the buyer. And So you get that far, and then it's like, this is the final roadblock we cannot get past. So, so however, we're working it out. We're working there it out. There you go. <laughs> we, we are working it out, but it was a surprise to everyone. Uh -huh. That's the thing, you know, if you have the knowledge, you can almost always find a solution to these roadblocks. Uh, very few properties uh, I've dealt with encounter these roadblocks where we just have to give up entirely. A lot of times it just takes thinking outside of the box and coming up with creative solutions, whether it's a trade over here or uh, you know, some, some sort of creative solution. And so I think that's uh, one, one area where experience and, and knowing the issues uh, backwards and forwards really helps. Well, our wonderful um, 
wonderful community town in the woodlands is a great example of when you were saying in order to get past part of the roadblock, you ended up uh, dedicating land for a park. I mean, so much of the woodlands happened because mm -hmm. land was dedicated for parks and recreational areas and such, and we got past literally the environmental side mm -hmm. because of that. So you still are seeing where that's part of the negotiation. If we can have this much land, we'll give back to the county, the community, so much for parkland or mm -hmm. recreational or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. So what is your go-to, both of you, when you want to keep up with current market issues, what's going on, what is your go-to source for that? Do you have a certain place that you go to to read? Is there you know, um, I don't an know. online source that you go to? Uh, CoStar is, is my Bible when it comes to uh, commercial real estate listings and information and historical data and analytical forecasting. CoStar, C-O-S-T-A-R. Uh, it's owned by uh, the LoopNet folks. Some of you may have heard oh, of LoopNet. Okay. LoopNet and CoStar are brothers and sisters now. Uh, they have they have quarterly reports and annual reports and they just have a wealth of data uh, that, that that helps me. Uh, some of the larger firms, I'm a boutique firm, so I don't have the uh, staff that the, the in-house researchers. So the larger companies um, produce um, reports mm -hmm. that are readily available. Um, so I use use that Houston Business Journal. Well, it's definitely mm -hmm. working for you. What about you, Mark? Well, I'll say one thing. Uh, Google is my friend. <laughs> Isn't Google <laughs> you, awesome? You can, you can Google just about anything. And if you don't know the answer, you're, there's no excuse <laughs> not to have the answer because you can most certainly find it on Google. But uh, no, but aside from that, really, uh, I read everything I can real estate related, anything I can get my hands on. Uh, so whether it's uh, publications like Red News or Community Impact, um, there's always constantly little clues in every kind of uh, publication uh, giving an insight to what's coming, what's happening. Obviously staying ahead of that is uh, very important in real estate. Uh, further education through courses like Champion School of Real Estate, uh, you know, I would say you know, don't just take the basics. Uh, there's, there's a lot of other courses that you offer beyond just getting licensed that are helpful and useful. Uh, there's designations in commercial real estate that you can, you know, when you further uh, mm -hmm. educate yourself, you can become designated so that you're behind your name on your business card, you can have these little designation letters. Uh, but, you know, th that further education can help you to not just be successful, but to really be an expert in your field. And I think uh, that that's very crucial. It is crucial. I was telling both of them a few minutes ago when they got here, about one of our courses called AI, Artificial Intelligence, and how one of our own brokers developed it. And now he's in Tel Aviv. He started out with three people that worked for him, and then it moved to 16, now it's 20. And his artificial intelligence software is a, I don't want to, he would probably kill me for saying this, but it's similar to a virtual agent, but better than that, where if you were driving by a property and you saw his cell phone number on the sign, you would call that. It could be 500 people driving by at the same time. Whatever question um, came into your mind when you saw the property, you would call Ron's cell phone number on the sign. And the AI brings back a very legitimate, sincere answer. And then you keep this conversation going and you totally believe that this agent, this broker, is the best, most customer service related entity you've ever met in your life. And um, he's developing it as well for the health services business. But we have that available for our agents as a continuing ed course to just let you know, you know what's coming up. But what I'm so impressed with is how that over these transition of many years, how both of you have gone through, how many cycles have you gone through, Brenda, up and down, and knowing in your mind that yes, it's a down cycle, but it's going to come back up. Well, has it been two th or three? With three majors that I can. Three majors. It's been three majors for me. And I call those great learning 
learning examples, experience you can't buy, to know that you're in a down cycle, but it's going to come back up. And, and really, uh, you know, with enough experience, you learn how to capitalize on those cycles. So there's money making opportunities even in down cycles. Absolutely. I mean, let's face it, when things are down, people want to sell. So that creates opportunity. If you, if you learn to recognize the opportunities during a down cycle, you can make money during that down cycle. So uh, experience and education help to, to further your ability to do that. And to know that you can do that. Right. And what I loved was how enthused Mark got when you started talking about that. We can tell he's made money during the down cycle. <laughs> And uh, so let's go a whole different direction, a little bit on the personal side. So obviously you both have been very successful, are very successful all of these years. How do each of you, tell us a little bit if you would about your family, how do you do that balance between work and personal? Ah, um, I have a daughter. Um, I married. I married later in life, and I had a daughter a little later in life. My uh, career was established at the time, and um, I didn't take much time off work. I mean, I'm I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about balance. <laughs> <laughs> now you're sitting next to someone. <laughs> but, uh, we balance. We balance. For balance. you ladies out there, I took a call between contractions. Okay. <laughs> You took a call. I took a business call. Yeah, no, that's bad. That is not balanced. I can't say that. <laughs> that is not balanced. Do not do it. I, uh, I took a call literally after clipping the cord. Oh, <laughs> oh that's so funny. So it's yeah. Okay, yeah. you're very similar. <laughs> oh, oh goodness. But no, I, I had a nanny. Fortunately, um, uh, when my child was young, pre-teen, before she was driving. And I just did what I call reverse nanny. You know, I'd say, you go, you, you, you go to the grocery store and, you know, you, you take care of all the things that I don't want to take care of and I'll watch the kids for an hour. So, you know, my lunch break would be spending time with my daughter. But this, I guess one of, the, one of the conversations I remember most was uh, taking my daughter to school and uh, I was always on a call, you know, in the carpool line. And she said, Mom, can you get me a cell phone? And I said, of course not. You're, you know, six. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want a cell phone? And she said, because I'd like to talk to you. Uh, so that's, oh, that, that was a showstopper for me, uh, uh -huh. you know, to learn how to be more present. Uh, for my family. And how sweet that she wanted to do that. And how sweet that she wanted to talk to me. Yes. Uh, uh, so so to, today it's much easier because I'm, a, I'm an empty nester. Uh, uh, but, you know, I found myself, she's in school so much that um, that, 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 that time in the car, the carpool line, and I would make time for carpool, which was 8 a.m. And, and 3 in the afternoon. I'd make time to take her to school and to pick her up and and, I, and the phone would ring and I'd look at her and I would say no one is more important than you are. Ooh, so reinforcing to yeah, her yeah. why you're not taking the call. I had some makeup work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but t you know, I still struggle. I still struggle well, with my husband because he's like, put the phone down and look at me. Uh, because, it, you know, what I do is so exciting and I, and I love it so much and people ask me, how much do you work? And I say I work 20 hours a week, 16 hours a day, because I'm, you know, my mind doesn't stop, even though I'm not in front of people, uh -huh. uh, my mind doesn't stop. So I think it's a, it's a, that is a challenge, you know. Back to your very first question, what is the big challenge, and and, and balance can be. Well, I'm going to take it from here because she has a beautiful uh, daughter who is at Baylor. She's at Baylor. She's at Baylor. And such a sweetheart. So you did a super job, even though you took a call during contractions, <laughs> which is no big deal, right? <laughs> no big deal. But she has a lovely family. And Mark, what about you? Well, finding a balance is uh, definitely a, a conversation that I find having with my wife quite often. Uh, you know, I've got three boys and, and I'm married. Um, so. It can be tough. And, you know, in this business, let's face it, we're somewhat our own boss. Uh, you've got to be a self-starter. You've got to, if you don't get out and do what needs to be done, if you don't have the initiative to do it yourself, you're probably not going to make money. So it's important to, to, to constantly uh, be at this game. You know, 
almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I'm thinking about it when I'm awake, uh, what I can do to, to increase my business. And that can present a challenge uh, with family. So you have to find that balance. I think it's important to begin each day by thinking about the things that you need to get done that day uh, and by prioritizing those things and tackling those things first and foremost uh, during the day. So just creating a schedule I think is, is very important. Uh, are you a morning person or? I'm, I'm very much a morning person and my wife is not as much a morning person. So, you know, I'm, I'm often up at uh, four in the morning and, and wow. I'll, be, I'll be returning emails all morning long. Uh -huh. um, so that, that's good. But on the flip side, oftentimes in the evening, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be working late on the computer and returning emails and calls and things like that. And my wife is like, get off the phone. But, uh, you know, sometimes you have to be available in this business. Uh, in this day and age uh, with cell phones, you know, you can be available almost anywhere. And so the good news about real estate and being kind of your own boss is you make your own schedule. If you want to take that trip to Cabo, go ahead. I've done it many a times where I've laid on the beach in Cabo and, you know, there's a phone call and I'm talking business from some destination in Mexico. So, you know, I, I think it's important to stay in touch with your clients. It's important to uh, tend to your business um, it, as it happens. And with, with a cell phone, you can do that. Uh, but uh, the flip side of it is, you know, sometimes you're, you're working at strange hours. Just a question and aside, because it comes up regularly in the classroom. So if you're up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., do you go ahead and return your emails or do you put them over in a box and let them go out later in the morning? What do you do? Curious. They go out. No, they go out. They go out. I return emails. Okay. Uh, and you don't mind if people see, oh, Mark, Brenda, they're up at 4 a.m. No. Okay. <laughs> we have that little, just tiny little question debate. If I'm up doing business, I'm just like going to keep it going out. So yeah. I was just curious. All right, all work, no play. We know we all don't live that way all the time. So what do you what do you like to do in your leisure? You just mentioned Cabo. Is there anything else you do to, you know, be the full, well-rounded person? So what is your leisure time? Yeah, we, we enjoy travel as a family and, and like to go different places. And so uh, luckily having a schedule where I can take off, uh, we, we do travel uh, at least a few times a year. Uh, my boys are, my oldest two are involved in sports, so that takes up a tremendous amount of time. Uh, they're either in basketball or baseball or soccer. Or, uh, that usually on the weekends we're doing some kind of juggling act activities. with the kids and different activities. So, it's but we enjoy it. Fun, of course. Yeah, if of you course. Need to be. <laughs> What about you, Brenda? What do you like to do for leisure? Fun? Well, my, my office would say that every day is a party with Brenda because, you know, oh, uh, fun is my, fun, fun is what I, I think that work should be fun. So our, uh, our company Christmas party was at, uh, in Orlando at Disney World this year. Yay! So that was fun. That was fun. That was fun. Um, I take time, I take time, I, I, my husband says I travel too much because, you know, I could take probably four trips a year. Uh, maybe five. In fact, I ran into Rita in Rome. I was going to mention where, where was it? <laughs> we were outside, I think it was the Orsay Museum. Yes. And Henry and I looked over and I said, I see Brenda Pennington. <laughs> and you were there with your daughter. Yeah. Was that her high school trip or something? Oh, it was Graduation just trip? another summer just in the life of Allison Pennington. 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 Yeah. It was fun. Yeah, that was That fun. was a good trip, but such a coincidence seeing so, you there. I take time on Thursdays, uh, Thursday mornings for a Bible study. That's really important to me in my church with the ladies. Good. Um, so that's, not, well, you know, it's funny. I call it non-real estate time, but there's always someone, there's a lady who wanted to, uh, you know, lease a warehouse for her volleyball company, which is a big business, by the way, Vol uh, volleyball, um, what is it, the, the leagues, you know, where the parents spend $5,000 a month so their kids can right. play volleyball uh -huh. on, a, on an Olympic level. Uh -huh. uh, so, yeah, God's always using... Uh, some sort of um, Bible study to do a real estate deal for me. <laughs> so you never know. Yeah, you never know exactly. <laughs> so, what advice would each of you give to a new person wanting to go into commercial real estate uh, on getting started? What What would your advice be, Mark? 
uh, advice on getting started, you know, I would just uh, re-emphasize, you know, after your classes, uh, continue to educate yourself on uh, different aspects of real estate. Real estate law is incredibly important. Understanding contracts uh, enables you to craft the best uh, contracts and deals for your clients. Uh, understanding development issues, uh, civil engineering and things of that nature help you to overcome the roadblocks. Um, I would say if you can have the ability to join a company that would provide you the necessary tools uh, and the support that you need, that's that's going to be imperative. Uh, real estate is not one of these jobs where you can jump right into and start earning a check. Uh, it's typically commission based. So if you can find uh, a place that will support you uh, for that first year or so, uh, enabling you to learn the business, that's really crucial. Uh, you know, we, we provide that at Caldwell Companies and uh, I think it's uh, really enabled a lot of agents to come in very green uh, and, and end up having very successful careers. Perfect. Thanks. And Brenda? Well, Mark and I came from, from somewhat back, different backgrounds. You know, if, if I were a betting lady, I would have lost money because uh, with Mark's last name, I thought for sure he'd be going to work with his dad. And I really admired the fact that he, he went the corporate route and went to work for a company uh, to, 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 to get all those basics and, and to learn the business from a structured corporate standpoint rather than, you know, my dad's a, a mogul in real estate and I'm just going to ride on his coattail. So I admire that about you. Thank you. Um, I, on the other hand, it was a sink or swim and there was no option in between. And so my best advice to you is not to try it, just to do it. Uh, jump in with, with, you know, both feet and uh, you know, believe it can be done because if other people is, have done it, you can do it too. You can do it. That's what um, I love about all. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I just I want to resonate on what you just said. I mean, that's important having the I can do it attitude. Uh, I I really don't know the word can't. Uh, no matter how large the deal is or what the challenge is, um, I'm always determined to try to figure out a way I can get that deal done. And uh, so that's that's very important to believe in yourself that you can do it. And and. Be prepared to hear the word no. Uh, you know, a large part of what I do in order to get business prospecting for new clients, we're out there beating the bushes. You know, we cast a really broad net. I would say on average for every hundred people that I reach out to, I might get 10 responses. Out of that, maybe one of those converts into a deal. One out of a hundred. That means I had to hear 99 no's in order to get a deal. So have a thick skin and, and you know, just be patient and keep at it. And when you hear no, just that's okay. You're that much closer to getting a deal. Great advice. Wonderful advice. And um, absolutely, we have learned so much from the two of you today. You are such fine, professional, great role models for our industry. And uh, I love having you here today so that all of our wonderful customers around the state that we appreciate so much can see that um, success absolutely is all about having faith in yourself. It's about getting up in the morning and getting ready to have a transaction happen today. And, um, and also just being professional and making such a great statement to the general public that you're in good hands. By just looking at these two, you know that they are good people. So may I add one thing? What would that be? <clears throat> well, if you're interested in um, commercial real estate um, and you find yourself able to live in Northwest Houston, I'd love to talk to you. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. Good. Well, no, I, I would. See I would. An no. invitation there. It's an invitation. So grab your pen and paper uh, because I have an email address for you. Uh, and it's N W H O U J O B. That's Northwest Houston Job. So N W H O U J O B dot com. So send your resume in and we'll chat. And that's why she's successful. <laughs> <laughs> always selling. She's always selling, asking for the business. And you will get some of our wonderful people yeah, that oh say, gosh, gosh, I'd like to work for her and with her. Love to talk awesome. to her. Awesome. Well, I do want to give a shout out to our president that's in Plano, Texas. Hello, Kimberly. I know she's watching today. 
And uh, I know that she is as enthused, excuse me just a minute while I reach down and get this, she is enthused as I am about our campaign that ends uh, March 31st. We just have started it. It's for Make-A-Wish. The Gulf Coast chapter of Make-A-Wish has invited Champion School of Real Estate to make a wish for at least one child. And uh, you'll find on our website today the banner. You'll find the donation button, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever amount. You can make your donation for a worthy child that would love to have their wish come true. So we're kicking that off today, and it ends March 31st, and our goal is to definitely make a wish for at least one child. So please go to our website and look at our Make-A-Wish uh, flyer and donation button. On a regular basis, I love to walk into the classroom and say thank you for your business, and I tell you exactly what I know from my heart, and that is without your business, I don't have one. As uh, being the founder and owner of Champion School of Real Estate, whether you are in real estate, loan, appraisal, inspection, business development, we so, so appreciate your business. And thank you, thank you for being a champion. Next month, on March 20th, we will have our quarterly update. It will be a finance update with Paul St. Amon, and we are inviting a superstar loan officer mortgage broker guest to join us. So that's on March the 20th. Thank you for being a champion. Thank you, Mark Terpster with Caldwell Companies. Thank you for Brenda Pennington with B. Pennington Commercial Real Estate. Thank you. What a great day today. We've learned a lot. Thanks a bunch. Appreciate it. Thank you.